Hey guys, uh, oh, that's a real close up of my face there. Welcome to a video of my face. Um, so, yeah, so I thought I'd do a bit of a different episode for the Kane Audio vlog series. Um, every now and then, I'm going to be doing one like this. It's going to be a bit of a Q&A session, I guess. Um, yeah, which is one of the reasons why I ask you to sort of get involved on the YouTube channel and leave your comments, whatever it is you want. Um, ask some questions. Um, so the first thing I always get asked, and I do always get asked this, is you know something along the lines of how you make Skrillex bass or whatever um it's not that kind of video thing I like I know the first few videos I've done have been pretty sort of tutorially but I kind of want it to be more about just little tips and tricks and little ideas and little thought processes and maybe how I approach uh, a certain technique or something um I don't really want it to be a step-by-step -step guide on this is exactly how you have to recreate this sound or whatever it is you're doing um so yeah so first things first that's probably like the most common question i always get as a sound designer as a producer you know how do you make your bass sound like skrillex how do you sound like i don't know avici or whatever and um i you know, sometimes a new artist will come through with a, a new style or technique and, and don't get me wrong, it, it does blow my mind when I hear something and I'm just like, whoa, that is a, a clever sound or whatever. But I'm not really interested in copying it necessarily because I, I, I don't see the point. Well, they did that sound, that's their sound, so why would I, why would I want to do that? Um, and I think that's probably my kind of first big tip for new producers uh, and amateur producers any you know if you guys want to make a career in music as a producer or whatever then you kind of need to get your own sound and and you might be amazing at copying Skrillex's bass line or whatever but Skrillex did that so you're only ever going to be second best to him um so I, I don't see the point in trying to sort of copy other people um i think it can be a good learning process t to learn how to make that sound and whatever sure but if you're just going to write a track that sounds like someone else well you're not that someone else be yourself um so yeah i, I guess that's one thing um uh, another question i get asked a lot is how do you get your demos ready for sending to a record label how do you get signed to the label whatever and you know i'm fortunate enough that right now i'm signed to mousetrap which is a huge deal for me personally because it's it's a label that i love um i, I mean pretty much everything they've put out since day one has been just totally unique um and you know i'm incredibly proud to be a part of that but something i've got to say is that you know that's been a long process it's taken a very long time to get to this position um and oddly enough uh i kind of got sound signed to to mousetrap the moment i stopped giving a shit really um and i think that's kind of key to it really um you know if you if you're trying to write music for a label um you're kind of doing it for the wrong reasons so in terms of how you sort of approach something musically at the production stage um i think you know write music for yourself write something that you like that you're proud of and then once you've got that once you've sort of once you're happy with that uh really that's the time where you go okay now which label would best be suited to this um and I, I've got to be up front as well. I was uh, talking to a mate of mine, Sonny Wharton of Wartone Records, which is, again, another great label that I work with. Um, and we were sort of talking about um, a project I've got going on at the moment and how 
Uh, the project is I'm aiming for four tracks. So far I've finished about 15. Um, and we were sort of talking about the numbers in that. And uh, and that's kind of an interesting point, I think, is that I, I worked out about one in 20 tracks that I start get finished and probably one in 20 tracks that I finish actually like get sent to a label or or whatever um so you know it's a tiny percentage and i think that's that's quite important in the world of art um you know you, you don't want to be churning stuff out and go oh that's finished therefore it's ready for the public that's not really the case um yeah so i i wrote a a blog post a few years ago now about sort of talking about the old days of vinyl and when pretty much anything especially electronic dance music was all vinyl only really um cds were kind of a new thing especially for djs um and i was sort of talking about how as a producer if you wanted to write a track and have it released through any record label um first of all most of the time you kind of had to hire a studio um, and that cost money and you needed an engineer who could actually program the sounds for you. Uh, once you got past that stage, you then needed to submit it to labels, blah, blah, blah. But the important bit is those labels, if they wanted to release that track, they had to do it on vinyl. It cost a lot of money. So they were sort of fronting minimum of 10 grand really to get a decent promo out and get it pressed to white label um, and again you know you'd be looking at maybe 10,000 copies whatever um, and you know that cost money so the label had to uh, really sort of invest time and money and everything into your release so they had to ask themselves is this gonna make me my money back now of course making music is about art it's not about money hands down there's there's no denying that but if you want it to be used by a business, and let's face it, a record label is a business, not an art outlet, um, then you know you, you need to be able to question, well, is this not only does it sound good, but is it great? Is it a, is it a great track? Um, and I think that's quite important. Um, so when it comes to sending tracks to labels, um, you may well have finished a track as i often do finish a track but that doesn't mean it's worth sending to labels just because it's finished just because it sounds all right just because there's no mistakes in there or sounds complete uh you know the the, the final question you've got to ask yourself is does it sound good um and more importantly will it fit on this label you'd be surprised the amount of uh, friends i have who run labels and i used to run one myself um and the amount of demos you get through where they're like, oh, I'm a big fan of your label and, you know, here's my latest track. Do you want to sign it? And you'd listen to it and you'd think, well, this is nothing like what we release. So they're clearly just spamming. So I kind of feel sorry for a lot of labels these days. They must be getting ridiculous amounts of emails through from randoms just sending you a track. So... When it comes to getting signed to a label and sending your tracks, preparing your tracks, you kind of need to do something different. Again, it was kind of easier to do that in, in the old days um, because you could press it to a CD and stick it in know, a luminous green envelope or something. And, you know, it was something a little bit different. Um, but there's nothing to stop you doing that now. You know, if it's a big label and they have a headquarters somewhere, you know, ask them for for their address. Send them a CD. Send them uh, send them a fucking box of chocolates. Do you know what I mean? Something that's going to make you stand out and show that you've done your homework. You've done your research. You you know you're not just spamming any old label. You you know you need to be able to prove that you've chosen to send your music to this label because this label is what you think is the most appropriate, and, and it does need to be the most appropriate. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's kind of the first real bit of advice I've got for, for sending tracks to labels. First of all, do your research. Second of all, 
before you send them anything, you got to question, is this right for them? And not only that, is it good? Um, and yeah, I think that's probably it for sending tracks to labels. Um, the other thing, I guess, is if you're not going to do it by post, which, don't get me wrong, it's, kind of, it's almost a silly idea these days, and, and I think it would take some guts to do that. But if you're going to be doing it by email, you need to probably just approach the label by email and don't give them your life story. Don't, um, you know, don't copy and paste your whole biography they don't care about that but at the same time don't just stick a link in there you know give them a few sentences on who you are what you've done so far have you released with anyone or, or you know are you 16 are you 56 are you um have you only been producing for two years or 10 years none of these things really matter but they build a picture in the a and r manager's head and they they kind of help the a and r manager or the listener whoever it is at the other end of the email they kind of help them go right okay i'm listening to a 12 year old's track you know i'll bear that in mind or a 50 year old or whatever it doesn't matter um but at least they kind of know what they're they, you know i think it helps to visualize something in there um yeah and and start a bit of a conversation i guess um you know don't just send them unsolicited demos um you know ask them if it's all right to send them a demo first um yeah and and start that conversation yeah what else have i got coming up um i'm going to be doing some videos on uh, bass and kicks, harmonization-ish, how they fit together, how how I approach choosing a kick or choosing a bass line or, or bass instrument. Um, so there'll be that. I'll be covering some mid-side EQing, um, which is kind of one of those things that I use more in the mix rather than in the production so I'll cover sort of how I approach my mix uh, I'm going to cover developing percussion so there'll be a video on that um, how I sort of put my beats together and get a bit of a groove and where I start with all of that um, I've got one coming up on arpeggiators at some point um, in fact, I'll probably do that soon. Um, and a couple of little tricks I do with arpeggiators where um, there's a couple of things where maybe a note might drop out of key every now and then or a note just might throw something out. Uh, the other important bit is the timing of those as well, uh, whether it be note length or um, how they fit or don't fit into the grid. So there's a few tracks I've done recently uh, where... The track is 4-4, four, four, but I use an arpeggiator that's 5-4, so it doesn't ever quite fit fully into the track. Um, and there's another one where I've done a totally unique, it's not even on a, a, a time signature. Um, and yeah, so I'll be covering that. Um, oh, another one I, I saw, and in fact, someone asked me this question not so long ago, was... Uh, storage solutions it's a bit of a, a bit of a geeky one but i think it's quite interesting how people approach how do you save your project files how do you organize them how do you back them up and that's the important bit the number of people i've seen um there's a couple in particular i've seen recently on on facebook friends of mine who have had a laptop die or a computer crash or a hard drive failure and they've lost everything it's a horrendous situation uh it happened to me once in my very early days and i quickly learned back the fuck up um yeah so i now obviously being a bit older and a bit wiser and certainly more of a nerd um there are definite things that i approach when it comes to just saving a project file knowing that if I make any bad changes, I can go back and change it and go to previous saves without just clogging my computer up with crap. 
Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of all I can think of at the moment in terms of videos coming up in the series. As always, I'm gonna I'm gonna do these Q and A sessions every now and then. Um, so yeah, leave a comment, ask me questions. I'm hoping as the channel builds up, I'm kind of hoping that I'll be able to do some live Q and A sessions. Um, I don't know if that's gonna work. Um, I don't know if I've got the right camera kit for that, but we'll look into it. Um, yeah, I'm going to be relaunching my Loops label or rebranding and relaunching uh, in spring. So hopefully this channel will tie in with all of that as well. So we'll be learning kind of uh, approaches of sound design a bit more and approaches of how I tackle certain projects and whatever. Um, yeah. Oh, I've got a delivery of a new synth coming soon. Um, that I'm working on a uh, a preset pack for for a hardware synth. Um, I've seen pictures of it, and it looks pretty badass. Um, I haven't heard it yet, so uh, hopefully I'll do a little video on that, and you can watch me design a few presets and see how I go about it. Um, yeah, so there's kind of quite a bit coming up, I guess. Um, yeah, stay tuned. Like I say, leave me a comment, ask more questions. Um, I will save any decent questions that I think either I'm really opinionated on or whatever. Um, and I'll do another video like this. Um, maybe one that isn't so fucking close up to my face. But um, yeah, like I say, get involved. Hit the subscribe button if you like what you're seeing. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for now. See you soon.